good. Hello everyone, good morning. I am so happy to be chatting with you today. My name is Tiffany. I'm an educator here at the Aquarium of the Pacific and I'm joined in the studio today with my friend Amanda who is controlling everything that is happening behind me because guess what? I am not actually swimming in this exhibit right now. I am actually in front of a green screen and because of that we are able to go on a wild adventure from the coldest of waters to the warmest of tropics, all from the comfort of wherever you are at, your home, your classroom. Um, but I do want to say, if you have any observations, any questions, as I am giving you some information today, you can text us in. We do have a live text number. Oh. <laughs> we do have a live number, but we will get it in just a second. Um, for you. Um, but if you are watching the recording of this, you can email us instead of text us at live at lbaop.org. And I'll get that number for you in just a second if you do want to text in while this is live on Friday at 10 a.m. All right, today's topic is marine mammals and conservation. We're going to go really hard on that last part of that topic, which is conservation. Talking about, well, what are we doing here in the U.S. and globally for these marine mammals? But before we get into how we are conserving these animals, what on earth is a marine mammal? Let's go ahead and break down what that means. So first and foremost, they are a mammal. Just like you and me, we are mammals. If you have a cat or dog at home, they are also mammals. A lot of an land animals, lions, tigers, those are all mammals as well. What do we all have in common? We have hair, we breathe air, give live birth. Those babies then drink milk that the mother produces. Um, that's in general, they're warm blooded. That's what makes a mammal a mammal. But now we are talking specifically about marine mammals. So these are mammals that live in the ocean, marine mammals. So we won't be talking about freshwater mammals. So we do have some freshwater mammals that would be like some river otters. There's some um, porpoises that live in freshwater as well. But marine mammals are going to be things like cetaceans. So cetaceans is the family of whales and dolphins. So within the whale family, we have baleen whales, which would be our huge whales that have baleen. Think about our blue whale, our humpback whale, gray whale. All of those whales are uh, baleen whales versus our toothed whales. Our toothed whales are gonna be things like orca, our dolphins, and also porpoises. Now in the Pacific Ocean, where I am located right now in Long Beach, we don't have any porpoises off of our coast, but if you were to travel a little bit farther south, we do have porpoises. Now porpoises are sort of just like, they look like a smaller dolphin and have more of a rounded face. That is what um, a porpoise more so looks like. Um, our pinnipeds, our pinnipeds are going to be seals and sea lions. We do have local harbor seals and California sea lions, but there's one more member of the pinniped family that we do not have here, and that extra member would actually be a walrus, but they are also an important topic that we are going to talk about today. Otters, our sea otters that we have that we can only find this adorable little southern sea otter here in California, not so much in southern California anymore um, because before they were protected, they were hunted. That's why we have protections and conservation in place now, but we can find them generally in central California now. Polar bears are actually marine mammals as well. Bears are mammals and they live in this harsh marine environment. You might have heard how they're endangered. We definitely want to protect and conserve those animals, and we're going to talk about what we have in place to try and um, do that. And then a family called Cyrenians, and that is the family that we have manatees in. Now, we definitely don't have any manatees in the Pacific Ocean, but over in the Atlantic Ocean, we do have some manatees, and they still need our help, even though we can't see them here on our coast. Okay, so those are marine mammals, and what makes a marine mammal a mammal? mammals just like us, what makes it marine? Lives in the ocean, or at least mostly 
in the ocean. Our polar bears aren't constantly swimming, you know. Oh, and here is a picture of, yeah, it is a relative of the manatee. Okay, so how are we protecting and conserving these marine mammals? Specifically in the U.S., we have the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Now, if you have ever gone onto a whale watch, you have probably wondered, man, why can't we get closer to the whale? Why can't I? I want to dive in and swim with this whale. And in some other countries, you can do that. But in the U.S., because we have the Marine Mammal Protection Act, these animals are protected. We have to stay, in, when you are in a boat, a certain distance away from that animal so that we do not disturb it. If you get too close, that animal could become frightened and maybe it was feeding and it needs to eat that food to have energy to continue on its migration or whatever it was doing and now you have just frightened that animal and then it tries to escape because it doesn't know what you are, what you are about. So we have this protection act so that we don't get too close to these animals as to disturb them. We want to be able to view them. We want to be able to learn about them, but we want them to be able to live their lives without additional human disturbances. So the Marine Protection Act puts into place um, rules and laws like we can't get too close to these marine mammals, but then also we can't harm them we can't hunt them, we can't capture them and trade them around with other countries or around our own country. Now there are some exceptions um, to this rule and sometimes on a case-by-case -case basis as well, but as a general rule, we can't touch, harm, or disturb these animals in the U.S. So going on a whale watch, like I said, you can't get too close to these animals. Even visiting the beach. If you visit the beach and you see some harbor seals hanging out in the tide pool area, you do have to give them their space as to not disturb them. Now what qualifies as disturbing them? If you get close enough that they kind of hear you coming and they look up at you, disturbed them. And that goes um, for otters as well. I have actually gone kayaking around in Monterey Bay, and they are very serious about staying a couple of kayak lengths away from these animals because we don't want to disturb them. They already have enough going on with their predators or trying to find food, taking care of their babies. They don't need the added problem of people tourists just coming around trying to snap some good pictures of them. Instead, we get lovely pictures like this from people with super high powered cameras so that we do not disturb those animals because they are protected. Yes, and even our sea lions. So sea lions are not considered endangered right now. Thank goodness. Now, some of the other marine mammals that I have been talking about are endangered. But even though these animals are not endangered, because of the Marine Protection Act that we have in the U.S., these animals are still protected, even though they are not endangered of going extinct like some of our other animals are. Our sea otters are on the endangered list. Their numbers continue to slowly but surely rise. Um, but our blue whale populations, gray whale populations, they are endangered and threatened. So we want to make sure that when we are going on these whale watches, that we are respecting their space and that Marine Protection Act. Even if you are in your own private, private vessel as well, got to respect that distance. Now, that's stuff that we are doing here in the U.S., but these animals travel. Gray whales, for example, travel all the way from Alaska uh, down to the equator, down to those warmer waters down in Mexico. Well, what happens once these animals are no longer technically in our waters? Hmm. That is why we have CITES. So CITES is the Convention on International, so multiple countries, international trade in endangered species. So let me compare and contrast the two protections. With the Marine Protection Act, all marine mammals, no matter if they are endangered or not, are protected. So even our sea lions, not endangered whatsoever, but they are protected. You can't get too close and disturb them, try to touch them, try to hurt them. They are protected by federal law. CITES is international, so multiple, actually, 
couple hundred uh, countries have come together and decided, yes, we are not going to support the trade of endangered animals. Now that is just for endangered species. If the species is not endangered, like source of fish, we can get um, fish from Mexico to consume or what have you, as long as that species is not endangered. Now this applies to plants as well. Cannot trade or sell endangered animals or plants under CITES. And so that is going to protect all cetaceans. All cetaceans are somewhere on the endangered species list, being a marine mammal that is so large and at the top of the food chain, they can eat a lot of fish that are maybe contaminated. So we have seen a decline in populations, but then also humans having greater travel on the oceans. We see greater number of um, whales getting hit by ships. So things like that, their numbers are slowly declining. So all cetaceans are protected under CITES. All of those um, sirenians that we talked about, those manatees, they are also all protected under CITES. Manatee numbers are going down, so that's something that um, we see them in Florida for the most part, um, but some of their cousins are located in other countries as well, and they are all animals that we are striving to protect internationally. Uh, different species of seals, yes, here's that cousin of the manatee again. This one can be found in Asia, I believe. Um, different types of seals are also endangered. Here we have an elephant seal. So seals are endangered and protected under CITES. Um, the otter, so we have the southern sea otter here in California. There is also the northern sea otter. They are going to be protected under CITES. Someone can't come and capture one of these animals and try to sell it coat or anything like that. They are protected internationally. Walrus, another animal that is part of that pinniped family, they are protected under CITES. And polar bears, polar bears, you've probably heard about um, losing of sea ice, sea ice melting and loss of habitat for the polar bears. Because of that, we are seeing a decline, but they are protected. Um, and this just, again, just means that these animals can't be hunted or traded um, internationally by any of these countries that have agreed to CITES. But what are we doing to help these populations? Because just because we aren't hunting these animals, their, an their numbers can still continue to decline. So what further um, what more can be done to help these populations? Something that we have been doing in the U.S., specifically in California, is we are introducing marine protected areas. So marine protected areas such as Catalina. I know we have a couple of coastal marine protected areas in Southern California as well. Um, the entire area, you can almost think of a bubble around a habitat that entire habitat and area is protected. So any animal, any plant that calls that entire area home is protected. Now, why would we want to create these marine protected areas? Um, the government can create them um, for economic purposes. Maybe there is a resource in that particular habitat. One of the biggest concerns is biodiversity conservation. In the case of Catalina becoming a marine protected area, we had the giant sea bass that is very slow to grow up, mature, and reproduce. We saw their numbers declining, and so we protected that entire area. So instead of just protecting this one animal, now this entire habitat is protected. So the plants and animals that call um, Catalina home are now all protected. So because this one fish here, because this one fish was endangered, now everything else, the kelp, the crabs, the sharks, everything that calls that little area home, they are all now protected as well. So that's a nice added benefit 
of having a marine protected area versus just protecting one animal in particular. And then obviously, so biodiversity conservation, we want to protect all the different species of animals, but then also specific species protection is also a reason why um, we can have a marine protected area. Um, down in Laguna, all of the tide pools and going out a little bit into the ocean as well, they are all marine protected areas. And what that means when you are visiting those areas as a tourist, as a guest, that just means that you are able to observe and learn but you are not allowed to touch the animals or take any of the animals home. Now you might be thinking, yeah, of course, I'm not gonna go touch this seal or take this seal home, but there are animals in these marine protected areas that you might not even realize are animals. Think about if you've ever gone to the beach and collected shells before. I know I have done that as a kid before, but in these marine protected areas, you are not allowed to even collect the shells because the shells could be potential homes for hermit crabs or um, sea anemones, like to use little shell pieces of shell to protect themselves as well. So marine protected areas not only are protecting our large pinnipeds or cetaceans that could be in the area, but even the smallest algae or crab that is in that area is also protected um, under that um, particular law that we have. Now, more about the marine mammals that are specifically endangered. I mentioned that we have blue whales that are endangered. And if you live in Southern California along with me, here's a nice picture of a blue whale's back and his little dorsal fin that you can see here. This was captured on a whale watch. But blue whales migrate down past California and we can see them every summer, but their numbers are declining now. I don't know if you know this, but blue whales are the largest animal to have ever lived on our planet. Now, when I first learned that, that kind of blew my mind. I always think about dinosaurs as being these larger than life creatures that once roamed our planet, but to learn that these blue whales are something that we currently have on our planet and they are the biggest animals ever in the history of the earth. That is wild. So this super, super huge, huge animal and yet their numbers are declining. You would think they are just at the top of the food chain. Everything else is food for them, but these animals are actually eating super, super small fish and krill. And you can see one of these large baleen whales lunge feeding here. You saw that mouth really open up. They take in a big, big gulp of water there. And in that gulp of water, they capture all of those little fish and krill that are kind of hanging out in that little school or cloud together. And then they are able to use their baleen to filter out the water and then just eat all of that fish and krill. Here's a nice little picture here. So this is what we are seeing. Instead of having teeth like we do, they have baleen that works almost like a pasta strainer, I like to think. Oh, we do have some baleen if you would like to see. So in the front, it looks like a bunch of plates. So if you were to look at a baleen whale smiling, it kind of just looks like a bunch of sticks almost. But then on the inside, we have all of these fibers. And so they push the water through their baleen. But then the things that they are trying to eat actually can't make their way through this mesh inside of their mouth. The water can go through, but all of the krill and small fish cannot make it through. So instead of being a, a top predator in the ocean eating other large things, they are actually eating some of the smallest things out there. Um, some other animals that are of concern, but also in the cetacean family are actually the vaquita porpoise. So now I mentioned that in the cetacean family, we have large baleen whales. We have toothed whales like orcas and dolphins, but then we also have porpoises. 
Now, we don't have any porpoises here in Southern California, like I had mentioned, but the vaquita porpoise is a close neighbor. They are endemic to the Sea of Cortez in Mexico. Now, endemic. That's kind of a new vocab word that I had just given you. Endemic means that they can only be found in that one area. So in the case of our blue whales, our orca, our bottlenose dolphins, they can be found in multiple locations and have um, little pods of their own in various locations around the Pacific Ocean. But these vaquita porpoise can only be found in the Sea of Cortez, so not super diverse in their habitat. They have just this one small location where they can be found. Now, if anything were to happen to that one small habitat, what do you think happens to this animal? And if you do have any questions, there is that text line, that live text line for you that is available now. Um, but what would happen to this animal? Think about a forest that we have on land. If you were to cut down the forest, a lot of animals call that forest home. What happens to all of those animals afterwards? Do they just find a new home or do you think they die? In the case of the vaquita porpoise, they only call the Sea of Cortez home. So there really isn't anywhere else for them to go. For whatever reason, they are adapted to live just in that small area. And the Sea of Cortez, if you've never looked at a map, is kind of protected by land on both sides. So it is a small little sea as opposed to being out in the open ocean. It is protected by land on both sides. And then the bottom part is what spills into the Pacific Ocean. But they are adapted just to live in this small little area. So what is being done? Our Marine Protection Act that we have in the U.S. doesn't apply to Mexico. So what can be done and why are they endangered in the first place? So the vaquita porpoise, we like to think of dolphins. Dolphins are super energetic and friendly creatures. Porpoises? Not so much. So this is a Pacific white-sided dolphin. It honestly looks a little bit like a porpoise, but you can see that it does have a little bit more of a beaked face than a little bit more of a rounded face, um, but they look very similar. So dolphins are super acrobatic. You go out on a boat and they love to play in your waves. Porpoises, on the other hand, are pretty shy animals. So a long, long, long span of time goes by and people that are living in nearby villages in the Sea of Cortez have never even seen a vaquita. So for some people, the vaquita is almost a myth because they are so shy and so few in numbers. Scientists didn't even discover the species at all until um, the mid-1900s. They finally discovered, oh, hey, there's a tiny little cetacean living in this area, but then they didn't really know much about it aside from that. And it took a couple more decades to actually get more information about the vaquita because they are so shy. But by the time scientists, you know, finally figured out what this animal is and a little bit more information about it, they realized that it was endangered. So in the 90s is when this animal was listed as endangered. And as of right now, um, in the 2020s that we're living in, they are critically, critically endangered. And that is because of unsustainable fishing practices that have been happening in the Gulf. But again, if they don't have marine protection, marine mammal protection acts um, in other countries, then there's nothing to really enforce protecting this animal. There are a couple of organizations and scientists that have gone down to Mexico to learn more about the animal and to educate people about it, but there's still that desire and economic um, productivity down there for fishing, and because of some of the unsustainable fishing practices, the vaquita is unfortunately caught as bycatch. So what that means is fishermen want to catch fish or they want to catch shrimp, but then unfortunately the vaquita will get caught in those nets. 
and then they are a mammal just like us and they have to come back up to the surface to breathe but if they are stuck in a net they are unable to do so so the vaquita is a cetacean that is critically endangered that um, is endemic to the sea of cortez but other marine mammals are also in need of our help this is a picture of a gray whale every winter time so right about now is kind of the start of gray whale season where in southern california if you go on a whale watching adventure you might be able to start to see some and that is because these gray whales they live up in the colder waters up over by alaska and they live in those colder waters because that's where all of the nutrients and food is. So they live up in these colder waters, but every year they all make the journey past Washington, past Oregon, all the way down past California, down into Mexico where the waters are warmer. Why on earth would they leave all their yummy food in the cold water to come down to the warm water? What do you think? Why would they s travel thousands of miles every single year and then guess what they have to travel thousands of miles back up to their home that's a very very long vacation long travel time that takes months and months and months for these animals but what is the purpose they are actually doing that for breeding and for having their babies so most marine mammals are going to have a layer of fat called blubber that keeps them warm in the cold waters. Now there are some exceptions like our otters, they just have really, really thick fur, but all the other marine mammals are gonna have a thick layer of fat. But when you're a brand new baby, you aren't born with that fat layer of blubber. You have to eat food to get that fat layer. So the nice gray whale mamas will travel down to the warmer waters to have their babies so that their babies are warm, a little bit warmer while they try to pack on the pounds, get some of that blubber, and then make their way back to the colder waters of where they live. But also the warmer water is actually less dense. So the babies are a little bit more buoyant in the warmer water while they're still learning to swim. Because whale babies, I mean human babies, they don't learn to walk until they're at least one years old after being born. But whale babies pretty much have to pick up and start swimming immediately. So being in those um, less dense waters and then being a little bit more buoyant helps them swimming. So what we're seeing now is actually drone footage of whale migration. So you can see, we don't always see multiple whales, but they do, can um, sometimes when they are migrating, we can see some of them kind of going along on the journey together. So that is always fun to see. But then after they have their babies, they have um, finished their breeding season, they are then going to travel back up to those colder waters. And then in, here in California, we will see them pass by us again. But sometimes we can then see the moms swimming along with their new little babies. And she is going to be training that baby, giving that baby information, and then in a couple years, that baby is going to go on the migration all by themselves, um, either to breed or to have a baby of their own. Now, these gray whales, you might notice have a lot of coloring going on. So you can see that they are gray. We have some white patches here. We, they have lots of barnacles, but they also have whale lice that you can see here that is pretty it's not as bad as it sounds. It's not like when humans get lice and we have to get rid of it. Um, but it is something that gray whales have. And ooh, yeah, you can see this one has a lot of different barnacles. And we can actually use some of this to identify individuals that we see year after year. They kind of have the same different patterns on their body. If we could get maybe a picture of their fluke, that works really well with humpback whales, but also um, gray whales as well different patterns on their face or, or on their tail. If you take a picture of the same individual, um, you can compare the two pictures and say, oh yeah, this is the exact same whale that we saw last year. All right, we are, oh yes, and then here is what a whale tail looks like, also known as a fluke. Okay, we are out of time. Hopefully you have learned a little bit about 
all of the different type of marine mammals that we have, so many different types. Um, we have cetaceans, pinnipeds, otters. We have our manatees and our polar bears, so many different types of marine mammals. But we are seeing a decline in their numbers for the most part. And so we do have to do our part to conserve and protect these animals. Hopefully you have uh, learned a little bit about that and then also feel empowered to try and do something to conserve these animals. All right, until next time, have a great weekend.